we're busy with a series on fathering. Um, and so we started last week. We are running this series around the four values that we have here in our church. Family, foundations, freedom, fruitfulness. And last week we looked at family. This is God's desire. And we looked at the purpose of family, why it's important for people to live in family, and family really being the building blocks of society. Um, today we're going to talk about foundations. It's going to be a pretty long sermon. So please lock the door there at the back. Nobody's allowed to leave. Um, and... I am very aware of the fact that what we do throughout this series is very sensitive to some of you. For some people, it's more painful to hear this than for others. But the reality is, when you can acknowledge and recognize where the problem is, it's easy to solve. It's in denial and when something is in darkness that it festers and you cannot get healing for that. So a lot of people struggle with father wounds, or what we call a father wound. Um, now, when I say a father wound, I don't necessarily always refer to the father. Last week we did. I spoke pretty harshly last week to the fathers. Okay, so today we're going to talk about more parenting than fathering. Um, so let me just first say the difference between fathering and mothering. Okay, what is the difference between father and mother? And you'll probably then recognize where culture takes people as well. A mother in general is an enabler. A father should be empowering. Okay, what is the difference? A mom will take care of the needs. She will wash the dishes. She'll clean the room. She'll do everything. And the kid becomes lazy because mom is the servant. Isn't that true? <laughs> what does the dad do? Go clean your room. What does the kid do? No, you clean it. Go like, you think I'm going to clean your room? No, I'm not going to clean your room. Mom goes like, don't worry, I'll clean your room. What is the difference? Moms generally take care of external needs. A father is supposed to deal with the internal identity of the child and bring out the empowerment and the gifts. And in order to do that, how do you build muscle? You put resistance on it. Okay, so mothers, you should see in our house, I put resistance on my kids in order to build stronger character. And what does my wife do immediately? Don't be so harsh with the kids. Why? Because moms just want to protect. Dads wants to strengthen. Now, unfortunately, in the cultures that we live in today, we have male mommies and female mommies. You get that? Because we've lost the ability to empower our children. We just enable them, and then they grow up being these lazy kids that are entitled and think the world owes me something. It's time that we toughen up as fathers and love and sometimes love a little bit in a tough way. Okay, now we're going to talk about that today. Okay, that's found. Don't understand what freedom is. And freedom comes only through fathering. When you empower someone to live in the purpose that God designed them to live in, which means you have to put them under that situation where they can build that character. Okay, then you live in the freedom of purpose. So we're going to be talking about freedom next week. And then the week after that, fruitfulness, it's about launching someone into what God has for them. And these are the four values of our church, family foundations, freedom, fruitfulness. And this is what we revolve around here. The series, the, the, every sermon has its own verse that we look at, but the series is built on Galatians 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent out the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, saying, Abba, Father. Last week we looked at that a little bit in more detail. <clears throat> sons are those who mature, children are immature. Okay? So the Spirit of the Son means we have relationship, not serving. And then we looked at what is... Abba Father mean. But today, foundations. You're excited about that? How do you know? You haven't even heard it. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, I pray today that your spirit empower me to bring this message with conviction and truth and honesty and authenticity, and that every person here today will hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to them individually. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Today, I want to point back to you 1 John 2, verse 12 to 14. Some of you might have read the book that I wrote called It's Time to Grow Up. And the book is based upon this, this verse here. So turn in your Bibles, 1 John. I hate this microphone. Verse 12 to 14, and we're just going to look at a couple of things from there. It says in verse 12, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. And I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I've written to you, children, because you know the father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And in that verse, we see three very particular stages of growth. John talks to little children, to young men, and to fathers. And then he qualifies each of them and says what happens during that particular stage of growth. He says young men or little children. He says you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to know the Father. That's what we're going to talk about today. Forgiveness and knowing the Father. Then he says, young men, you need to be strong, know the word, and overcome the evil one. That's what happens. You cannot let little children fight the devil. Young men need to fight the devil. How many of you in the beginning of your Christian walk were just like, wow, God is good. He supplies all my needs. And then suddenly one day you you bump into the devil and you go like, where's God? That's called fathering. Okay, Mothers are particularly, and we'll look at that today. Mothers are very important to the first few years of a child's life in that uh, bonding. But then a a father needs to raise the child, and that's where fathering then is important to actually put that child in a situation where he can learn. That's young men. The Bible says there, you need to become strong. How do you become strong? Put a little pressure on. Okay? Pick up that dumbbell. That thing is so aptly named. Dumbbell. Okay. Repeat over and over. What does it do? It causes pain, but it also causes strength. And this is what you call productive pain. There's a difference between destructive pain and constructive pain. A father's main job is to cause productive pain. Productive pain doesn't destroy, it strengthens, yet it's still painful. And then It talks about fathers, and fathers are those who know him who was from the beginning. In other words, they understand the eternal purpose of their own design and God's plan in the kingdom. So we have these three stages of maturity. Today we're going to look at the first. Little children. It says, you need to have your sins forgiven and know the Father. So I've said, okay, this is about the gospel, forgiveness and adoption. So these are the three things we're going to talk about today. The gospel... Forgiveness and adoption. Um, I think my slides are in the wrong order here. No, we'll, we'll just put them out like that. Th- let's, let's start. <clears throat> that's supposed to say the gospel up there. Okay, that's why I thought my slides were in the wrong order. In Romans 4 verse 5, it says, But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. Now, there's a couple of words in this verse that is very important. Now, what is interesting is the gospel is the blueprint for parenting. The gospel is the blueprint for parenting. If you understand the gospel, you'll understand how to raise your children, how to be a father, okay, how to be a mother. One of the reasons we don't know how to parent is because we have absolutely no clue what the gospel is. Now, what is interesting is when we would look at the gospel, there's so many different versions of the gospel out there. I am part of our faculty for our theological school, Every Nation School of Ministry, and one of the exercises we do with church planters, I'm running the church planter track, is we spend a whole day um, just looking at gospel presentation. And then Tom Jackson, who does our theological track, he spends a whole week explaining the gospel. So in this church planting track, now you would expect people who plant churches to know the gospel, right? 
It was just me that kind of, that's kind of that naive to think that somebody that goes plant a church needs to understand the gospel. So we have this exercise where I go, like, okay, what you need to do, just share the gospel. We want to see, do you understand it? And you, would, you will be surprised at how little understanding people have about the gospel. They can explain prophecy, they can explain Moses' revelation, they can explain the Apostle Paul's theology, but they cannot explain the gospel, the basic gospel. Here is what happens with the gospel. I'm going to show you this little video. This, this is the problem with the gospel, okay? So what they're doing here is this guy is now showing that guy something, okay? And he's communicating that. Now he has to communicate that to the next guy, and there's this whole line of people that's going up, okay? So he is now explaining to the second guy what he heard, okay? Or he saw, or whatever was communicated to him. And you should notice where communication starts breaking down. There's a very, very long queue, okay? Now look at where communication breaks down, right at this point, because it's pretty clear that this girl don't know a motorbike. Okay, look, look at the way that she does it. Go like, that's, that's not the way that you start a bike in the first place. You don't, you don't kick start a bike, and you don't ride a bike like that either. I mean, the first guy did it pretty well. So let's speed this up a little bit, and we're going to see where we're going to end up at the end. And this is pretty much what's happening to the gospel. Okay, one guy thinks he has this, and then he gives it over to the next one. And uh, so look at where it sounds. It looks like they're worshiping. Look at this lady. It looks like she's in a worship service. Look at that. Go like, yay, whoa, this is the gospel. And then they go on. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. Look at that. I mean, what? where did things go wrong? I mean, really, this is... Look at that. She's not even saying the wrong thing that the previous person told her wrong. <laughs> now you're going to be surprised at where this thing actually ends up. It looks like they're in a yoga class or something. <laughs> okay. Look at that lady. What? what? What is she doing? I mean, everybody adds their own little flavor to the, the whole thing. <laughs> and you see, that, that is what happened to the gospel. Okay, how do you solve that problem? Let's quickly think about this logically. How do you solve that problem? Okay. In the first place, everybody should look at the first guy. Don't let this go over and over and over. Or, what do you do? You record it, and then I don't tell you my version of it. I take the recorded version, and I show you. Isn't that true? That will solve the problem. How do you cause miscommunication? You take the original message, and you hide it. And I just tell you whatever I tell you. Okay, what is the second big problem there? Everybody only saw the message once. They were not trained. The first guy should have taken the second guy and go like, okay, here's what I'm showing you. Show me. Okay. No, 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 you misunderstood. Let me show you again. Okay, now show me. Okay, now let me look at you showing Jacques. Okay, and I've showed you. You show Jacques, and I go like, no, 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 no. That's not the way that you should do it. Let me show you again, and then let me watch you communicate that. Isn't that true? Then, then you'll kind of get that thing go on and on and on. How many of you have ever been to a gospel presentation training? Here's what we do in our gospel presentation. I tell people, imagine you're walking with a friend and there's some kind of random terrorist drives by. I don't know if you get something like a random terrorist. <laughs> okay, but a terrorist. But he shoots and a random bullet shoots your friend in the heart. Okay, you know your friend has one minute to live. One minute. There's not enough time for you to save your friend or call an ambulance. You know this is it. 
Your friend knows this is it. You have one minute to share the gospel. One minute. You know this is, this is the end. I better get this right. What are you saying? And you know what? I've come to realize, and this is what we're going to talk about today. The reason we don't know how to be a parent is because we don't understand the Father. Because we don't know how God fathers us, because we don't understand the gospel, is the reason we don't know how to parent our children, and they have faulty foundations in their lives. They grow up as confused adults, and then we go like, bad children. So here's the gospel. Okay, you want to hear the gospel one minute? God created the world, everything. We rebelled against God. Because of the rebellion, we separated from God. God in His grace came to redeem us. That's the reason Jesus died on the cross. And then He restored us through His Holy Spirit. That was what? Not even a minute, right? You get that? Nothing more, nothing less. Everything else that you know in Scripture needs to be laid on this foundation. If it's not, you are building religion and heresy. I don't care how true it is what you say. Because anything and everything that is built upon the wrong foundation will end up putting people in a place where I have to earn this, I have to do this myself. You get this? That's, that's what's wrong with parenting. So when we go to, on the mission field, mi missionaries have the most creative ways of sharing stories. Okay? So there's this one organization in South Africa. Um, you guys might know them. They use um, sport to illustrate the gospel, and they go into um, very rural places in Africa where people are completely illiterate, so they cannot read. I cannot put this slide up and they understand that. So they have to use different methods, and they use colors. How many of you have seen the color gospel? Okay, they use colors. God created the world. Everything was nice and lush and green, and then we turned against him, and our whole life turned black. Jesus came and he shed his blood for us to redeem us. And because of that, we are now washed of our sin and we're completely white. So what they do, they take balls, soccer balls or footballs, and they put these four colors on the ball. How many of you know that if you go into certain rural areas in Africa and you take out a football, you're an angel sent from heaven. <laughs> I mean, prosperity just dropped down. I mean, they play football with sticks and stones that they put together. You take out an actual ball, they go like, oh, there's a God. <laughs> I mean, they believe straight away. Just seeing, Some of them have never even seen the ball. And then what these missionaries would do is they would explain it based on the colors, and they go like, any one of you that can explain the gospel can have one of these. I mean, you have instant missionaries. <laughs> Little kids, grandpas, they come like, God created me. I separated from him, and uh, Jesus came to redeem me, and now I'm saying, do you believe that? Y yes, I believe. <laughs> you want to accept Jesus? Yes, can you give me a ball too? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It is amazing. It's amazing. It is as simple as that. A lot of people say this book is difficult to understand. Listen, it's four colors. This is, this is the, whole, the whole Bible, really, on one screen. If we don't understand this... You will not understand anything else in the Bible. Don't try and explain complicated theology. I know people who have master's degrees and doctorates in theology that if you ask them to explain the basic gospel, they get it wrong. And you go to yourself, you know everything about the Bible except the most important part? Now, let's take the gospel and see how this involves parenting. We start with forgiveness. But people, again, our verse in Romans 4 verse 5, but people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who what? Forgives sinners. Now, unfortunately, there is this teaching that's out now that's very popular that we don't have to repent anymore. God has forgiven. We don't repent. Okay, now, I agree with that to a certain point because my children will always be my children. doesn't matter how naughty they are. My kid doesn't want to, he doesn't need to come back to me and say, Dad, I'm sorry for what I've done. Can I be your child again? He will be my child 
doesn't matter what. He doesn't need to be in a state of repentance in order to stay my child. So I get the, the gist of what people say. You don't need to earn God's favor again by repentance. But here's the other thing. How do you understand forgiveness if you've never done anything wrong? You get that? You will only understand that you can be forgiven of your sin if you understand that you have sin that needs forgiveness. You can either say out or amen, but that's true. I believe with everything in me, everything in my whole theological understanding of the Bible, if people can understand sin, they'll automatically understand they need a Savior. If you understand that you're a sinner, then you would know that you need forgiveness. The reason people don't think they need forgiveness is because they don't think that they're sinners. What does that have to do with parenting? I'm really glad you asked because I'm going to give you the answer. There's something called honest parenting and deceptive parenting. Honest parenting versus deceptive parenting. What is an honest parent? Let's start with a deceptive parent, then you'll understand what an honest parent is. A deceptive parent is a parent that does not give the child proper self-awareness. For instance, if you would overpraise a child, you never tell the child that he's done anything wrong. There's never any discipline or correction. It's always, you are the greatest, you're the best, I am so glad you're here, this is awesome, nobody is like you. What do you do with that child? We think it's encouragement. There needs to be the point like, what you now did there was wrong, we need to fix this. I unconditionally accept you, but what you did was wrong. You get what I'm saying? What happens, and this is so, so scary. I was listening to Dr. Romani, what is her surname? It's a funny, funny surname, a Middle Eastern surname. She's a professor of psychology at um, UCLA, and she explained different um, mental uh, diseases or mental problems. And one of them is narcissism. What is a narcissist? A narcissist is somebody that has an overinflated self-image that has never gotten to the point where they realize, I've done anything wrong. Everything is about me and my big ego. And she explained that over-encouraging parents that never give a child an objective view of themselves and never help them to understand their wrongs and their rights and forgiveness end up raising narcissists. Do you know what a narcissist is? It's somebody that has no empathy, somebody that has no humility. It's all about me and my big ego, and I'll do whatever I can to build life around myself. Have you ever met a narcissist? Narcissism, sociopaths, and psychopaths are within a legal framework, criminal behavior. These people actually belong in jail. They are the type of people that will do criminal activity without any conscience. Scary, isn't it? You need to understand that you're a sinner in order to understand that you are forgiven. You are not perfect. You need forgiveness. But as a parent, and this is where this hypergrace theology is very scary, because we now... Deal with people who never take responsibility for their bad behavior. In other words, we don't build character, we build narcissism. What did God do with us? Did he come to us and go like, you are so perfect, I am so glad I made you. Man, if it wasn't for me existing, you would have been on the throne. <laughs> You're the best thing that I've ever done. Perfection personified. <laughs> Has God ever told that to you? No, what does he do? He comes to you in your sin and brokenness and go like, I unconditionally accept you. How can you accept me? Because I've forgiven you. Come, you've forgiven me? Yeah, why? Because have you ever seen a dirty room that's in the dark? You don't see any, any of the dust on the table. How do you see the dust on the table? You open the windows and you go like, oh my gosh, close them again. 
I just caused myself a lot of work by opening that window. Let me rather close it. You know, denial is better. <laughs> That's what happens when you come into God's presence. God is light. He reveals everything. You know, many years ago, you would have asked me, how much sin do you have in your life? I would have probably said maybe one or two things. Now that I have a closer relationship with God, there's more of His glory and light in my life. How much sin do you have? Oh my gosh, I don't have enough pieces on, on the place on, space on the paper to write everything down. Why? Because the closer I get to God and His holiness, the more I realize, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm a sinner. I need God. Another problem, the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath. A psychopath is somebody that has genetic, it's a genetic disorder. Okay? And, and a psychopath is somebody that will hurt other people without any conscience. They will, they will kill and have no conscience. They'll steal and have no conscience. These, a sociopath is the same, but they're not born, they're made by their parents. Okay? How's a, sociopath, how's a sociopath made? Parents that enforce external behavior and not internal character. In other words, the child has to comply to certain behavior, otherwise the parent is not going to accept him. You know people like that? I know this one, one family. This is a few years ago. And... Um, the dad, he is he's a very broken man himself, but he is so strict. Everything, I mean, he quotes scripture, every, just the most religious guy you've ever seen. He is so strict with his children. They are not allowed to behave anything wrong. The punishment for their wrong behavior is so severe that the children grow up in fear. There's no forgiveness. There's no unconditional acceptance. There's only love based upon my perfect behavior. What now happens? That child grows up with this hatred on the inside for authority. I have to do everything, and I will manipulate and lie just so that you can like me. That's what you build into that child's foundation. That's what happens when we are not honest parents. You're not objective. What you did now is wrong. We have to fix this. Let's talk about this. If you've ever had your children in tears, they're like, I am so sorry. But we want to be, and, and let me say this. Parents that create these children that are just behavior control, it's because they have themselves a very bad self-image, and they want people to look at their children as being perfect, so that they as a parent can look good. You get that? God doesn't have a problem with his self-image. God has never had a depressed day because I did something wrong. Because like, oh my gosh, there goes Trevor again. What are people going to think about me? You know what? I just have to disown him because seriously, he, he's ruining my reputation. I mean, parents, honest. How many of you have ever been ashamed of your kids? Only me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, I'm confessing today. <laughs> okay. Like, oh, my gosh. People know he belongs to me. <sighs> what are they going to think about me? <laughs> God doesn't have that problem. We do. So what do we then do? God doesn't have a problem if you go and sin. He understands forgiveness. He understands redemption. It was his plan in the first place. So you go to your child, and now you want your child to behave perfectly, otherwise you're going to look bad. And what do we do? We create these mental disorders in our children because we're not honest parents. We're deceptive. Either we are so over-encouraging, telling him that he's great, and he grows up not understanding that, hey, you know what? I am not the best thing out there. Have you ever dealt with a narcissist? They have absolutely no feeling for someone else because it's all about me. I've dealt with people, adults, that has done the most grievous sin, and you can find no repentance in them. Absolutely none. And you think to yourself, where have you come from? Don't you realize what you are doing is hurting someone else? Let me just put this disclaimer in before I tell you this story. When, when I tell you these stories, okay, I don't, I don't refer to people sitting next to you, okay? I once shared a story with someone, and the guy went like, man, it's so difficult to figure out who you're talking about. It's not someone that you know. <laughs> okay. 
it's someone in another country. You've never met them before. <laughs> okay? No, honestly, I'm not going to, if you tell me your story, I'm not going to expose that here. But I, I use people's examples. So this is someone that you don't know in another country, but this guy grew up and he, he's, I mean, if he would have a formal professional diagnosis done, I mean, the guy would end up in jail, really. The narcissistic behavior in him, and I, I personally, if I would diagnose him, I'd probably say he's a sociopath, but I don't have the right to do it because I'm not a professional therapist. But his complete selfish behavior, he is so good at manipulating people. Where does it, where does it come out that he is like that? It's in his marriage. You usually speak to the husband or the wife. The most abusive people, emotionally abusive, physically abusive, mentally abusive, sometimes sexually abusive people you can find at, in their homes. None of their friends will ever go like, that guy abuses his family? Are you, are you serious? Because the overinflated ego makes them present themselves to people in the best way ever. Yet at home, the foundation is not there to love because there's no empathy. You know, in a marriage, a marriage, um, it shouldn't have been called a marriage. It should have been called a mirror. All right, let me repeat that. Marriage should have been called a mirror. Why? Because in marriage, you're going to realize you're not perfect. So what does a narcissist do when he's in a marriage? Don't realize that this is actually a mirror showing me what I'm doing wrong because there's no concept of wrong that I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness. The concept's not there. So what do you do? Everything that goes wrong is your spouse's fault. Everything. And you will enforce them to love you, even to the point of abusing them. And you go out to your friends and you go like, that guy, never. So this particular situation that I'm referring to, if I would introduce you to the husband, you will never in your life think that he abused his family. To the point that his son didn't even want to have anything to do. He didn't even want to mention his name. I spoke to him at one point. He goes like, I don't even want to, I don't even want to call him my dad. The hatred was so much. This father is convincing everybody that the mom that he abused to the point where the doctor told her, if you're not leaving this marriage, this guy's going to kill you. He is now convincing everybody. She turned his son against him, and she's making up the stories. And everybody believes him. Why? Because he has no conscience. Because he has no conscience, he doesn't understand the fact that he's lying. Does God tell us that we are that perfect? Does he build into us that overinflated uh, uh, um, self-image? Or does he actually say what? He forgives what? If you don't understand sin, you'll never understand forgiveness. It is important for us to understand we should not be deceptive parents. We should be honest parents. Can you see where the gospel is so amazing? It doesn't save you because you're perfect. This is our verse that we are putting this up here. This is our verse. People are counted as righteous, not because of what? Their work. Mom tells the little boy, and this is particularly mothering, because mothers don't want to put the pressure to build the character they want to enable. Okay? Now, mothering is not wrong. I mean, you cannot force a child the whole time. You're going to build a slave. Okay? So there needs to be the balance between fathering and mothering. But when you have a male mother and a female mother, the child gets enabled and never understands that it is not based on works. It's total unconditional acceptance. And we create children with mental disabilities because we're not honest parents. Look at what um, Phyllis and Stein say in their book, um, uh, title of the book. I forgot to write it down here. Psychological Trauma in the Developing Brain. It says, a warm, intimate, and continuous relationship with his mother or permanent mother substitute is essential for the child's emotional and cognitive development. In other words, there needs to be that kind of attachment. This is now adoption. Before we get there, I'm actually running ahead there with that quote. When it comes to honest parenting and deceptive parenting, it is important for the parent to be honest, just like God is with us. You are a sinner. I'll forgive you and adopt you. 
Now, the child needs to understand in that state of me not being perfect, there is this adoption. And what is adoption? Okay, now we have this quote, so I forgot to say that. A warm and intimate, continuous relationship with his mother or permanent mother substitute is essential for the child's emotional and cognitive development. Now, last week we talked about adoption quite a lot. I'm going to give you the different stages of child development now to show you where adoption takes place and how this is important throughout a child's life. But attachment research over the last few decades have demonstrated how the quality of a child's bond with her significant caregivers ex um, affects mental health. I'm going to take you through the different stages of child development. And you're going to see through every stage of child development God's character being revealed to us. This is the reason you need to understand the gospel. Okay. Foundations are important. You get that? I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years. If you don't understand the gospel, you don't understand the fact that Father God loves you, you've unconditionally been accepted. Okay, you cannot understand anything else in the Bible. Here's the way that a parent reflects the gospel in parenting to their children. I've come to find people who misunderstand the gospel really has a problem with parenting. So we always take them back to the Father. Okay, so... In the first place, from birth to two years old is what we call attachment. And that's really where you care for the child. Okay? It, the child cannot do anything for himself. It's, it's, that's where they have to attach with mom. So we look at the previous quote where it says the, the attachment between the, the primary caregiver, especially the mother or mother substitute. Research has found that people who struggle with depression from conception up to about two years old had a very bad bonding with mom. What is the most emotional place in your body? Is your mouth. That's why little children, if they want to look for something, they put it in their mouths. If children want to be soothed, what do you do? Put something in their mouth. If you love somebody, what is the first thing you want to do? Touch the mouth. It's the most emotional part of a person. And the moment there's contact with the mouth, there's those neurochemical pathways are being built for love and attachment. What is the first thing that a child needs to do once he's born? What do, what do they do? Give it to the mom so that he can start breastfeeding. And in that, what is the second thing that helps with bonding? Is eye contact. A baby can see 20 centimeters. That's from a mom's breast to her eyes. Mom usually looks at the baby. What is happening in that moment? The child starts attaching. Now, when that doesn't happen, this is usually where the child will then build, or a lack of these neural pathways being built, will feel like there's no love and struggle for the rest of their lives to that point of not being able to love. What is the first thing that God wants us to understand when we get saved? I love you. Unconditioned. Let's attach. And what are we supposed to do as a family, a church family? That's the reason we have small groups. You come and sit here, listen to daddy on a Sunday, ain't going to work. <laughs> You're a new Christian. What do you need? Love. You don't need somebody to tell you how bad you are. You just need love. You already know how bad you are. Get them into that place, and this is where we need to care. This, call, this is called discipleship. You care for someone. When Jesus came down here, what was the first thing he did with his disciples? Got them into a little group. He started making friends with them. Started building this relationship with them. He attached. This is the gospel. Then from two to three years old, it's exploration. Exploration. This is where kids will do all kinds of stuff. One of the questions I will ask people when I have interviews with them, especially for our internship, is were you, as a child, were you very sick and did you spend a lot of time in hospital? Why is that important? Because during this stage, two to three years old, the child starts exploring everything. And it's not just because they're curious. It's because they need to develop what we call their pleasure center. Pleasure center. Have you ever sat with someone in a restaurant and you go like, what do you want to eat? And go like, I have no idea. It's one of the questions I'll ask people. Another question I'll go like, if I would give you a three-month holiday, where would you like to go? 
How many of you can instantly say, yeah, I know exactly where I want to go? Some of you go like, I, I, I don't know. I have, I have no idea. What would you like to eat on the menu? Uh, can you choose for me? What happened here? The child was probably put in a playpen, didn't have the, the ability to explore. In other words, the neural pathways weren't built for them to explore what do I like, what do I not like. My, my third child, I've got, I've got four kids, my number three, one of the weirdest little two-year-olds you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> he didn't like sand. What kid doesn't like sand? <laughs> so we'll take everybody to the sand pit, and he will touch it and go like, ah. <laughs> He will not play in the sand pit without his shoes. I'll put him in the sand pit, he'll pick up his feet like this, you know, <laughs> like a little dog that you want to put in water. Have you ever seen that? Kind of like, ah, and he climbs up. So I would force him in the sand. He would scream his head off. That's cruel. No, that's fathering. Why? Because I want him to understand that is, that is a sensation you don't like. Build it in there. My other kids would run into the sand. I would throw them in there. And they'd go like, ah, I love it. Rub it in my face. Put it in my pants. So that I can go <laughs> throw it in daddy's bed when I go play there. Make sure my shoes are full of sand so I can throw it on his face when I get home. <laughs> that old boy hated sand. Okay, it's changed now. He, now he likes playing in sand. But he developed this pleasure center inside of him. He's seven years old now. Man, that boy knows what he wants and what he doesn't want. This is exploration. Okay, this happens through example. The parents need to be the example. The child will follow everything that you do. That's important. There you need to care for the child. Here you are an example. Now, you'll see everything on the list. You need to do that all the time, but this is the primary thing that you need to do there. Then between three and four years old, this is where the child finds his identity. Now, this, between three and four, is where the primary bonding between mom and, and, and child needs to shift between child and dad. This is where dad becomes extremely important in now playing with the child. You need to play, rough play, wrestle, hug, and throw them and, and those kind of things because in that, this is now where identity gets shaped. Have you ever seen parents that are not home? I call kids like that career orphans. Career orphans. Daddy is always in another country. When he comes home, he's sitting in his office. Okay, he's always out. So when dad comes home, you know, there's, they don't have this, and, and they grew up with everything. And mom and dad all go like, why are you angry with me? I gave you everything you needed. No, you didn't. You didn't give me that identity by playing with me because you're always absent. This is so important, identity. This is part of what God wants us to do. Again, discipleship. You cannot have a relationship with God outside of this family. You need to get into a small group. There needs to be that physical touch with people. You need to look people in the eye and realize, hey, I'm a child of God. doesn't matter what I do wrong. This morning, he messed up. I won't tell you everything that my kids messed up and <laughs> You're going to sit here the whole day. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. My, my oldest son, his proudest moment in his life, still his claim to fame, he is 12 years old now, is when he was born, I was so excited, I got him, I put him down on the table. The very first time he peed in his life, he peed all over me. Just, I am soaking wet. I go like, oh man, this is your first try. The first try. So I told him that, and he still go like, remember when I was born? I got gotcha. you. I didn't go like, is that what you think of me? I'm going to disown you, have another one. Okay. And then when he was about a year old, one time I took off his clothes, he was standing in the bathroom and we had carpets in our in our bathroom he was standing there and he could just barely walk he was pulling himself up and he, he's standing there butt naked cutest little bum he's standing there and i'm like i'm quickly going to the room go get something and he's standing next to him when i got back he put on the floor and he thought it was the funniest thing stepping it into the carpet <laughs> go like, look at that go like, eh, i still love you i don't know why i told you that it was just funny <laughs> okay then between four and seven this is where a child starts to build competence, certain skills that they have. Now, I know around about teenage years, they build different skills and then, then things go back. 
But here you need to support the child because this is where they build confidence. I can actually learn new, new things. In that confidence, you need to support them as a, child, as a parent. Now, this is where parenting starts getting difficult because as a parent, I want to control what my kids do because I know better, right? That only happens up to about this stage, to about four years old. Between four and seven, you need as a parent to stand back a little bit. Not completely. That you do later on. You stand back a little bit. At up to about four years old, you're going to wear the clothes I tell you to wear. No, I want to wear that. You look like a... You should see the stuff that my kids put on in the mornings and want to go to school. They're like, you can't wear that. At one point, I go like, just go to school in your jammies. I just don't care anymore. Okay. Yay. They like... My, my four-year-old, he now has this thing. He doesn't want matching socks. <laughs> Go get your socks. He brings two pairs of socks. I'll put on the one and put on the other one. Okay, that's it. <laughs> but up to that age is where I would enforce you will put on that jacket. You will put on that thing. But from about four to seven, you have to stand back a little bit. Now you support. Now my girl, for instance, well, she's 10 years old already, but my seven-year-old, he's... He's starting at that point where I want to pick my own clothes. And I stand back a little bit and go like, it's fine. You, you can wear what you want. But I support him and I'll say like, you know what? That doesn't really match. It's a little bit cold outside. Don't you want to put on something warmer? No, I don't. You're going to be cold. Okay, what do I do? I know he doesn't think, so I take the jacket along. <laughs> Halfway out, Daddy, I'm cold. Yeah, I knew you were going to be cold. Here's a jacket. Thank you. Okay, so what do you do? You don't enforce, you support. And you, you kind of back out on those. You get what I'm saying here? How many of you have ever felt God backing off from you? Where's God? You know what he's doing? He's fathering you. Just stay back a little bit. Why don't you decide? God, what should I do? God's silent. I tell you what, whatever you decide, I'll, I'll support you in that. Isn't that true? God is not in my life. Yes, he is. He's just standing watching you. He wants you to grow up so that you can make the decision yourself. Then we have, between 7 and 13 years old, concern. This is where you as a parent have to be concerned about the way or the child builds that own concern, and you guide them. You guide them. You let them take concern for their own decisions. Are they going to make the wrong decisions? Absolutely. What do you do as a parent? You go like, you chose to do that. Now the kid comes back and goes like, I really made a bad decision. It's, it's okay, come, let's sit here. Let's talk through this. Oh my gosh, I'm getting into this now. My, my girl's 10 years old, my boy's 12. I have to talk them through so many of the decisions they're making, and I'm leaving them, letting them make their own decisions, knowing full well where this thing is going to go. How many of you have ever made a decision and go like, God, why did you let me do that? And God goes like, <laughs> yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I knew you are going to mess up. Why don't you come back here? Let's sit. Now, at this point, this is where more than a parenting relationship starts happening. Okay. And then, 13 years and older, this is intimacy. Now you start building a mature relationship with your, your child, and you have to become more of a coach. You're still their parent, but you become more of a coach. In other words, I am now going to dig into you, build or get all the potential out of you so that you can become your own person. Now, next week, we're going to talk about freedom, and this is really what it's about. Freedom is you living in your full potential, not being at that level anymore. This is where narcissists get stuck, right here. They never develop character to the point where they go like, I know what I'm doing right, I know what I'm doing wrong. They don't have that self-awareness. God wants to build that self-awareness into you. It's called fathering. Now, you know how I know what level of spiritual maturity people have? I listen to their complaints. What are you complaining about? God is not there. You know what? If God is not there, it probably means he's, he's supporting you now. So it means you're still at that level. When you start complaining about, 
you know, I really don't know what decision to make here. I go like, okay, you are now at a point where you don't think God has to tell you everything. You want him to coach you in making the right decision. It's that maturity. It's like me and my dad. My dad doesn't tell me what to do anymore. But I can still call him for advice. What kind of relationship do I have with my father right now? A very mature one. I'm not blaming him for not playing with me. That, that's not happening. So when we go through this, especially when we sit in counseling with somebody, we go through this and go like, where did you get stuck? I tell you now, wherever they get stuck, that's the lack of gospel understanding that they have. When I listen to people share the gospel, I can tell you where their pain is. Because the gospel talks about forgiveness and adoption. And this is adoption. You understanding, whatever's wrong in my life, mom and dad loves me unconditionally. But they want to help me to grow. God does the same thing with you. I'm, I'm shocked at people that have been Christians for 30 years. And they're still complaining about God is not wiping my bum for me. Seriously, you should have been out of that already. You learning something? Okay, let me finish with this slide over here. There's a difference between adoption and control. We've already talked about control. When you adopt a child, it's I allow you to make mistakes. I even point out the mistakes. I help you to understand that I will accept you regardless of your mistakes. Versus control is you need to behave right, otherwise you're not a favor with me. That's what God does. This is what religion does. And then you have grace versus law. It's the same thing. What is grace? I've used this example many times, and this is what I do with my kids. My girl, one time, she was six years old. She wanted to, it was cold outside. It was probably like minus five, snowing, just wintry day. And she comes, she wants to go to school in a little short tank top and, and shorts. I go like, you cannot do that. And she starts crying, I want to do that. Now, I could have, as a dad, because I love you, I'm going to force you to do what I know is best. That's what most parents do. You do what I say. What did I do? I was like, that's pretty, my girl. I love your clothes. I tell you what, quickly run out to the car and go get daddy something in the car. Yeah, sure. She comes back. She goes like, I'm cold. Can I put in something warm? I go like, okay. What happened there? I did not control her. It wasn't law. I put her in a situation where she had the revelation. Oh, my goodness. Internal motivation will then change the external behavior. You need to realize that grace and law both will get her to wear something warm, but law will cause rebellion, where grace will cause loving motivation. You get that? We need to raise our children in a way that we don't control them because this family that I, I told you about where the father is that strict with his kids, at 10 years old, his girl already said, I cannot wait to get out of here because I'm going to do everything the opposite from what my dad told me to do. And then we see children grow up in these loving homes. And then when they leave the home, suddenly their head leaves them. How, how many of you know kids like that? Suddenly they start getting so rebellious and they start getting what? It's because at home they were never allowed to make a mistake. Does God allow you to make mistakes? He encourages it. <laughs> this makes me feel better as a parent because I'm going like, wow, when my kids make mistakes, when they go through pain, they can be healed. I don't have to raise perfect kids because they'll end up being narcissists. I'm going to raise, it, it comes naturally for me, damaged kids. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but... And that gives me a lot of comfort knowing that in my children's pain, God meets them. And in their pain, the gospel makes sense to them. And it's in their mistakes and their sin that they realize they need forgiveness. It's not in me trying to be a perfect parent, trying to raise a perfect child, that they actually come to grace. Because that's going to end up being controlled under law and creates rebellion. I would rather want to adopt them unconditionally with their mistakes. I would give them grace and help them to live from the inside out so that they can grow up and love regardless of their mistakes. That's the gospel. And these are the foundations that we need to have in our lives. Does this make sense to you? 
The gospel is our blueprint for parenting. The way that God parents us is the way that we have to parent our children. Now, if your parents made a, a mistake, listen, you need to move about 10 tons of dirt to get one ounce of gold. The more dirt you have, the more gold you'll get. Isn't that true? Stop going like, oh, my parents didn't do a good job. Go like, thank you, God. The Bible says, thank God for the tribulations, right? And in tribulations, give thanks. Go like, God, thank you that I didn't have perfect parents because now that gold inside of me is going to help me to understand you as a father. Whatever brokenness you had, it becomes your strength. Stop feeling sorry for yourself when you didn't have the perfect place. I know last week we talked about a lot of stuff that was really hurtful. Now I want to tell you everything that's hurtful, that's your prize. I grew up in a broken home. Well, now you're going to understand a perfect home so much better. Praise God for your brokenness. Because your brokenness will make you understand forgiveness better than anything else. And when you have that brokenness, you'll understand adoption into God's family clearer. Now as a parent... You need to raise your child in the way that God raises us. Can you see the gospel? Isn't the gospel amazing? We have what we call a launch pad. This is our, what, uh, it's our one-to-one -one translated. It's, it's um, the, the biblical foundations. I want you to get into small groups. Not do this by yourself. Isolation doesn't work. Get into a small group. And then we also, we're busy designing what we call a victory track. It's going to be a 10-week inner healing and deliverance and helping you through these issues. And we're going we're gonna to launch that within the first. I'm busy writing this and compiling this. It, it used to be over one weekend, and I'm changing the content so that we can do it over a longer period of time. We want everybody to go through this, everybody to have biblical foundations in their lives, to be in a small group and go through this victory track. And then we have new decisions that we do in London, and, and some of you might know about that. But I want you to understand today. Foundations are extremely, extremely important in your life. Now, if foundations were not laid well as a child in your life, you need to be born again. Be born into God's family, because then He's going to father you, and that's great parenting. Did you learn something today? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, your grace and wisdom is tremendous. We thank you, Lord, that even in our darkest moments, you build gold into us. That, Lord, we, we get to this point where we understand that our own brokenness is the strength that comes out in our lives as you parent us as sinners into forgiveness and adoption. Lord, today, I want to bless every person that heard this message. That, Lord, when we think about the things that went wrong in our lives, we will not Think of that as a weakness, but that as an opportunity for us to reveal your goodness. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us here will understand through revelation that you're a father that unconditionally adopts us because you have forgiven us. So, Lord, as we stand, we worship you now. I pray that we will do it out of a place 